Uh, I think we're going to start the session. Good evening, everyone, and good uh, afternoon for people who is out of different part of the, the area. And basically, this session about the refraction session, uh, it will be help me, I'm in trouble. And the first speaker, there's a slight change in the organization of the, the speakers. So Dr. Sharif Amara, he's consultant uh, in Dubai, in the consultant uh, hospital. I consult the hospital. He will talk about management of intracornea ring complication. Uh, Dr. Sharif is, uh, is Hi, good, good, uh, good, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sama, for the introduction. I just am going to share. Okay. Okay, now. But you can see, you can yeah, see it okay. right now, right? You can go okay, ahead. so my, my talk today is the intracornea ring uh, complications. Uh, the mechanism of action of intracornea ring is uh, the insert in uh, it's about the depth of 75, at least 75 corneal depth in the peripheral cornea. It uh, separates the corneal lamellae, resulting in shortening in the corneal arc length. So the central cornea, cornea flatten and the peripheral cornea become uh, more steep. And so the thicker, the insert the increase in uh, flattening. So the, 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 the mechanism of action, it reduces the corneal steepening and decrease regular astigmatism. This end, it causes displacement of corneal apex to the center of the pupil. Uh, the advantage of the intracorneal ring, it, it's a reversal in action. We can remove it anytime. It's minimally invasive approach. It doesn't affect the center uh, part of the cornea and improve the objective visual outcome and restore functional uh, vision. Uh, the indication is a clear central cornea. The key, the key reading should be between 45 to 60 diopter. The cornea thickness is at least 400, uh, 450 microns at the incision size, and the patient is contact lens intolerance. The contraindication is the key reading more than 60 diopter. The central cornea scar is not fit for intracornea ring segment. The recurrent cornea erosion affects the healing of the cornea, low bacimetry, the low bacimetry the, uh, decrease, the, the percentage of collagen fiber is decreased, so the effect of intracornea ring segment is uh, less. The, the most important thing is the unrealistic expectation. If the patient is uh, think that he will can see six over six after the ring insertion, don't do this for him. The, the most common uh, intracornea rings you are used, you are used intact. In text, we are using Kira ring or Ferrara ring and Mayo ring, but most, I think most of us is using the Intex or the Kira and Ferrara ring. We are uh, centering on the, the ring on the geometric center of the cornea and the, the depth of the tunnel should be between 75 to 80% the thickness of the cornea and the incision was made along the steep axis. We are I'm using the uh, intralase platform. I think all of us now or most of us is using the femtosecond laser to creating the incision and to create the, the tunnel. Now I, I will just, I will introduce one. This is my first case. This is a 20 years old uh, female. She has a keratoconus diagnosed as keratoconus. She's complaining of decreased visual acuity, uh, both eyes. The uncorrected vision on the right eye is 0.15 the, and the other eye on the left eye is 0.05. And this is her uh, refraction and the best corrected vision is 0.4 and 0.3. So this is her, uh, her uh, pentacam. This is the right eye and this is the left eye, and this is the OBD scan for her. We can see here the, the, the corneal, uh, the, the, definitely the right, the left eye is more advanced than the right eye. We can see that the steep key here is 52 and the, the flat 49, the other eye is 56 and 51. So I decided to make a uh, corneal uh, inter care ring for her. This is the plan. And as long as the hair best corrected vision is less than 0.5, so I decided to make the steep axis on the topographic uh, axis, the incision on the steep uh, topographic axis, which is 102 for the right eye. This is the this is the part. This is the incision site, and 79 of the in the left eye. This is the incision uh, site. Site. This is the post op. This is the right eye, and this is the left eye. This is the same as the, our uh, plan, and this is the post op. The this is the difference or comparison between the pre op. Uh, autoref and the post op, we can see decrease in both myopia and astigmatism in both eyes, especially for the left eye. And the vision, the uncorrected vision is improved in the left eye from 0.05 to 0.2, and the, the best corrected from 0.3 to 0.4. And this is this is a great result for me. But the patient is complaining about the quality of vision on the left eye. 
So I did, I did uh, uh, corneal topography for him, OBD scan. I can see very good results. I can see significant flattening of the cornea. I can see uh, displacement of his apex to the center. The, the, the ectatic uh, area become less. So I told him everything is going fine. Everything is okay. Just it's, it's a matter of time. The, the vision will improve. And this is the classifier or the navigator, which, which gives the percentage of the, uh, of the diagnosis according to the, the shape of the cornea. We can see the preoperative is the diagnosis is keratoconus 99%. Postoperative, it's hyperbic refractive uh, correction or others. So this is, this is a good, but the patient is still complaining from his quality of vision in the left eye. And so I, I decided to go more deep. So this is his. A wave front error. It's the 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 the, the surprise is that his wave front error is uh, become worse from 1.7 to 2.1, and I can find here that the total coma is almost the double from 2.4 to 4.8. So this is the reason why the patient is not happy or or is not satisfied after the coronary. So I I went back to his preoperative uh, map. This is the uh, topographic map, and this is the his high order operation. I can this is the coma operation. I can see this is the axis of the coma operation, and so I put my uh, Kira ring. It's not if I can find my Kira ring is not on the same axis of the coma operation. So it should be like this. I put it like this, and it should be like this. So this is the 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 one I put, and this is the should I, if if I want to respect the coma uh, uh, axis, I have to put the, the care ring like this. So this is, gives us the discussion of which, which axis I have to follow. The coma axis, we have three axes actually. We have topographic axis, we have refractive axis, we have the coma axis. We, we all know that the coma aberration is one of the most common aberration in keratoconus uh, patient. It, actually, this subject is, we have a lot of controversy. Till now, nobody can uh, make sure that which one is perfect. So the coma, the topographic, or the uh, refractive axis. Several studies have shown that the high order abrasion, especially vertical coma, are highly prevalent in keratoconus, and most effective correction occur when the ring segments are positioned. I decided to change, sh we should put the incision. If this is the coma uh, abrasion, we have to make the incision here instead of the uh, steep axis and put the ring on the same uh, axis of the coma abrasion. So I so this is why the patient is not uh, happy with the result. So coma has been demonstrated to have a negative effect on visual acuity because of the optical blur. Therefore, decreased coma along with topographic regularization might have contributed to improvement of central of the corrective distance visual acuity. I have another case, this, uh, this, I, I have this patient in my clinic. He did this uh, uh, Kira ring outside. I, this is very central Kira ring, very, very central. The patient is complaining a lot of halos and a lot of uh, starring uh, light. And I can see, I, this is the, OB, the, OB, the OBT scan of the patient. This is the pupil, the size of the pupil. And you can see here the shadow of the Kira ring. This is before, this is in photopic vision. And this is with mesopic. This is, this is very strange. We definitely we have, we need to respect the pupil size before implanting the, the ring. We all know that if we are, we need to correct the myopia. If the patient has more myopia, we have to put the, the, the Kira ring more central. If he has a stigmatism, we have more, we can put it six millimeter or seven millimeter, but we have to respect the pupil of the patient. If, if the pupil observation is like this, I cannot use five millimeter Kira ring in this patient. So I decided to remove the, the, the Kira ring and definitely I cannot put in 60 millimeter because the, sometimes there's an overflap between the two tunnels. Uh, my plan was to put in the six, seven millimeter and use Intex, but the patient, the patient doesn't want to proceed for more again for uh, corneal rings. This is, the, the, this is a case three and this is very uh, rare and very strange complication for me. This is a patient with keratoconus on the right eye, I put uh, the, the index and the, everything, everything went fine. And this is the result. This is the pre-operative and post-operative of the patient. And this is also the pre in the right eye. And this is post. We can see the ectatic displacement of the cone into the central uh, part and decreasing in the ectatic area. Patient is complaining of persistent discomfort and pain. I wait for two to three months, still complaining. He is not complaining from the vision, but the patient is complaining from 
pain and discomfort. The, 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 the intact in a good depth, it's not superficial. So I decided to remove the intra, uh, the intra the index, and I find the paper said that uh, sometimes the, when we put insert the intra the index or the intracornea rings, sometimes it touch one of the corneal nerves, causing persistent discomfort due to direct contact. And this is one of the the very rare complications of the intracornea ring segment, and so. Uh, segment migration also one of the complication we can treat it with we can suture make a suture and this is can happen also if the the cornea uh, ring is very close to the uh, site of incision uh, we have a lot of complications we have a corneal opacity we have this is one of the cases i can see here the broken uh, intracorneal uh, ring as i'm about to finish this is one of the this, this is the center intact due to i think this is due to manual uh, dissection, and this is also due to minor dissection, corneal vascularization, one of the most common complications of intracornea ring. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharif. That's very interesting. And I think really flip to second laser make the rings is much easier, less complication. Definitely, definitely. But yeah. we're going to Dr. Mohammed Hosni. It's a pleasure to have him with us. He's like, uh, hi, 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 good evening. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So basically, we we'll go. Dr. Mohammed Hosni is uh, or Professor Mohammed Hosni. We're going to talk about management of high astigmatism, post cornea graft, which is always a very challenging topic we're always facing. It's okay. all yours. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very, very interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Shri Fallon. I had uh, uh, some comments, but yani, later on, inshallah, when inshallah. You... if you save time from your session. <laughs> no, I get it. It was really a I good, know, no. a good Yeah, it is. That's definitely yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. It's it's me again. I, I really enjoy uh, giving any presentation uh, online when the, uh, the the panelists, most of them are friends, and this is the case now. So hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Mitra. Hello, Ahmed Alilo. Hello, Sharif Amira. Long time no see. I've just seen you yesterday, Osama, so I can't say this. So uh... <laughs> welcome. welcome, Dr. Muhammad. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you. So my presentation today is a, a little bit on the funny side. I have been uh, presenting this case in, in, in many, in many meetings. I think this is like the fifth time I present it. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it addresses the, the concept of post-PKP astigmatism. And we all, we all have, have this problem in our practice, especially uh, doctors who do a lot of penetrating keratoplasties or, or DALCs for, for that matter. And, and when you end up with a, a, a chunk of astigmatism, sometimes it's really challenging. Now, now FEM to second laser um, assisted uh, PKs has changed dramatically the amount of astigmatism that, we, uh, that our patients end up with. But again, still we do have astigmatism and we need to tackle it. So this is a case that I, I've, I've tried many things and hopefully um, the patient is still as happy as when I, uh, I finished uh, his, his workup. And I'm going to discuss it with you guys. These are the references. And post PKP healing usually ends with corneal astigmatism. After one year of surgery, the usual corneal astigmatism is in the neighborhood of one to five diopters. We all have patients who have like 0.5 diopters of astigmatism or, uh, or 0.25 diopters of astigmatism. We, we photograph uh, the autoref and we're very, very happy. But this is, this is out of the norm. This, is, this happens every blue moon. Normally, we have like between one and five diopters of astigmatism. Fem to second, uh, PKP has dramatically reduced the amount of post-operative cylinder due to the innovative wound designs, less suturing and smoother post-operative course. But when you end up with astigmatism, what can you do? You, you, can't, you have many weapons. And, and in this particular case that I'm presenting today, I, I use two weapons for the same enemy. So which one what, what would I use uh, more and which one would I use first? And this is really a subject for debate. But again, we don't have uh, much time to stop between slides and take the, pa the, the opinion of the panel and tell them what I did. So I'll just uh, dash off with the presentation itself. So this was a 41-year-old male who underwent FEM2 uh, second PKP in December 2014 by myself for advanced keratoconus. Surgery was uneventful uh, with a mushroom design. Everything was absolutely fantastic, smooth recovery, traveled after two months on his medications. And then he showed up after five months uh, uh, of the surgery with an attack of allograft rejection and a cordedus line tangential from 12 till three to 12, from 12 to three o'clock. 
and accompanying suture related inflammation, of course, in the same uh, quadrant. Rejection was treated with topical and systemic steroids under uh, a cover of topical moxiflux for any bacteria suture related infection. The patient responded very, very well, as they always do, and signs of both rejection and infection disappeared. The, the problem with rejection is the same problem that we face when you have a patient with uveitis. You can treat the, the bout and everything will be absolutely dandy and fantastic. But again, uh, uh, one time after one time after one time, you will end up with sequelae of this rejection. Usually it's fibrosis in the wound and uh, irregular astigmatism. So the area of treated inflammation showed moderate scarring and he was followed up regularly every month over the, sec over the next six months with a quiet eye and the best corrected vision of 0.7, which is 6.9. So the refraction was two point, plus 2.75 sphere with a minus 10 sill. The patient was intolerant to hard contact lenses as most of my patients are. I don't know if your, your experience is different. And uh, to spectacle correction, of course. So this was an artificial sort of best corrected visual equity. He saw 0 0.7 with uh, uh, the correction in the office, in the clinic, but he could never wear the glasses. So we never saw actually 0 0.7 in his daily activities. In February, 2016, he presented to my office seeking a solution, okay? He had an upcoming job interview actually in the Emirates. So this was the pre-treatment oculizer. In these patients, I rely on uh, placido disc more than, than tomography. So this was his oculizer. And as you can see, there was a nine diopter of astigmatism in, in his uh, topography. Again, 8.5 diopters of astigmatism. So we decided to go for arcuate incisions on the FS200, which is at the time, it was the only um, uh, femtosecond laser machine that we have in our center. Now we have two. So which nomogram? Most astigmatic keratotomy nomograms nowadays are aimed for uh, um, um, clear corneal uh, limb relaxing incisions like the Dono um, or the Napa. And these are mainly for cataract surgery, not for post-operative and post-femto uh, keratoplasty. So we use the combination of Magee Buzar, I will come to this later, and another FS machine, which is the interlaced nomogram for a seven millimeter optical zone. We believe that the topo treatment overlay on the FS200 will help us in planning the exact extent. And this is very, very nice. You actually project the topography of the patient on the machine, and then you, you sort of move the, your arcuit incisions until they are bang on the, the area of scarring. And so you, you get an, an excellent result without typing in uh, just the, uh, the axis of, of, the, uh, of the centration of your arcuit incision. So if, for example, if you put the arcuit incision at 60 degrees, for example, yeah, and then you, you do the overlay of 60 degrees on the topography, sometimes you need it to be 68, 64. So you, you actually move it, uh, and this is very, very nice. And this is a handy tool when you're using the femtosecond laser. What we really missed at that time was the cyclotorsion management. After docking of the patient, you end up with a little bit of cyclotorsion. And this is a primarily astigmatic correction. So any uh, off-axis treatment will end up with a sub-minimal uh, um, uh, difference in the uh, achieved uh, treatment that you would like um, uh, to, to give the patient. So this was the plan, exactly as you can see. You can actually rotate the, the, these uh, arcuate incisions as much as you want. You can go um, anti-clockwise, you can go clockwise, on site on the overlay that is uh, is shown um, on the panel and on the screen of the uh, uh, the machine itself. And we, we aim for 70% depth. Why 70% depth? Because I, I was a little bit scared that I would do a perf in this patient who had a, a previous uh, PK. And we did an offset. So the plan was to do an intrastromal arcuate incision. And at the time, this was very en vogue. This was very something trending that you do uh, the arcuate incisions uh, with the femto laser intrastromal. So you avoid the, um, any, any um, danger of, uh, for example, infection because you haven't opened uh, the epithelium and you cannot have the stray uh, microbe going inside your incision. And, and at the time, people said that it gave the same results and gave excellent results. So this is what we did. And this is actually a photo of the patient um, immediately after the treatment from the monitor of the machine. And it was an intrastromal effect. And we, we sent the patient downstairs immediately to do a tomography 
uh, and a tocalizer, and just to get, I mean, a placebo disc topography as well, to see the effect of the incisions that we've done. And surprisingly, we didn't find that we, it was very much effective because the astigmatic correction that we did, that we corrected, was only, you see, from 8.5 and immediately. And this was, if you, if you go here, it's, it's uh, 434, and this is around 6. So it's like an hour later, this was the topography done before the operation. We did, he went upstairs, changed his, uh, his clothes, went down to the operating theater. He did the, the architect incisions and, and immediately went down to do another tomography and he ended up with 6.7. So from 8.5 to 6.7, which in my mind wasn't a great deal of success. We only had two, two doctor cylinder uh, corrected. What do we do now? Should we open the incisions? So maybe we, we may get more effect or should we leave it for a few days to reach the maximum relaxing effect and uh, the remodeling of the cornea, then re-evaluate. Actually, our options was to proceed and open the incision or to chill out for a few days. I immediately sent the patient back to the OR and we opened both incisions to the surface with the good old school to, to do a good arcuate incisions and to feel the gaping of the arcuate incisions and to, to feel the effect um, of the arcuate incision. And immediately from 6.5 diopters, the patient became 5.6 doctors. So we, we started with 9 point something. With the topography, it was 8.7 and ended up with 5.6 with the arcuit incision. So this is the first message that you can treat astigmatism with the arcuit incision, with the fem to arcuit incision. I prefer uh, uh, to open the incision up to the very, very surface. And again, you will not end up with a maximum effect uh, in uh, uh, astigmatism treatment. So we lost three diopters of topographic astigmatism, but these three diopters of loss were, were, were really good and were really effective in the patient's life because it was no longer an artificial uh, situation where he put the 10 diopters of astigmatism in the, uh, on the foropter and uh, he, he sees 0.7. Now he ended up with six diopters of cylinder and the best corrected visual equity jumped from 0.7 to 1.2, okay? He felt improvement, but he, and honestly me, wanted more correction. I was going to prescribe, not six, of course, but I was going to give him in the neighborhood of four diopters of astigmatism and hope that he will see 0.7 um, um, for the rest of his life, and that's it, but, but I wanted more. So we decided to tackle the corneal astigmatism with the other weapon, which is the excimer laser or the laser vision correction. The first decision that had to be made, should we use, obviously, topography-guided ablation, or shall we use wavefront optimized because this is, a, 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 that, this is a best corrected accuracy of 1.2. And we do not want fancy ablation in this cornea that had a track record of having a mind of its own. So this, this cornea was absolutely fantastic. No rejection now and had 10 diopters of cylinder. Again, when we did the intrastromal um, uh, incisions, we did not correct much. So I didn't want to, be, um, uh, to give him a fancy topography uh, guided ablation. If, we've, if we just miss the registration with a few degrees, he can end up worse than uh, his situation now. So the second decision, would we do a surface ablation or would we do a LASIK? And if we're going to do a LASIK, would you do the mechanical microkeratome or would you use a femtosecond laser on a patient who had previous femtosecond scars uh, of complex scars, wide scars of uh, mushroom uh, penetrating keratoplasty? So these were the, the, our options. And I would have chosen topography guide ablation with a surface ablation. But this patient was due to travel in 10 days time. He wanted a faster visual recovery uh, uh, than what was expected after surface ablation, as we all know. So we decided, I decided to go for a TCAT with a femto uh, LASIK. Okay. So again, we do have the option if we are using our machine, the FS machine, uh, to do a, a nasal hinge flap, and you, you do have the option to do um, uh, an oval flap as well. And this, these are the things that I used. And the patient, after we did a topography guided ablation, came from 5.7 diopters of astigmatism to 2.4 diopters of astigmatism. So this was a real improvement. Now he was. Now we're talking. Now we have a patient who has a, a topography of 2.5 diopters of astigmatism, which will translate in a manifest refraction in the neighborhood of 1.75 diopters of astigmatism. So this is like a normal patient wearing normal glasses. One week post LASIK again. This was the, top, uh, the topolizer and it was the astigmatism showed 2.16, not even 2.4. So the manifest refraction would be much less than this. 
uncorrected visual acuity without any glasses whatsoever. It was 6.9. His refraction was 1.75 cylinder and the best corrected visual acuity was 1.2. Patient was satisfied and so was I, but he asked if I would recommend further corrective procedures. Now, uh, in, in, in keratoplasty, in keratoconus, the, 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 the wise decision is knowing when to stop, in my opinion. So our option was to counsel the patient, advise him to wear his spectacle correction for the remaining cylinder and not to consider any more procedures, or to jump in and do schedule the patient for an evaluation on his next annual vacation to prepare him for surface ablation to correct the residual cylinder. And honestly, this is what I call... <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Run away, run away. But the time is running away from you. Okay, just one, <laughs> one, one more minute. So just a quick resume of this case. Stigmatism was 8.5 diopters. It ended up after we did an arcuate incision without opening the incision to the surface to 6.7 diopters. We opened the incision to the surface was 5.6 diopters. And then we did a malasic and he ended up with two diopters. So this is uh, 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 what we did for this patient. So a quick over overview. Classically, the, po the, the post PKP arcuate keratotomy was done freehand, and we had we had uh, very very poor actually nomograms like the Lindstrom nomogram and Hanna nomogram. I don't know if this is correct or not, but I've been told by one of the fellows of Lindstrom, uh, he, he's an old man now, that he actually uh, he wrote his nomogram after doing nine patients. So this wasn't any uh, like something that stood the test of time or is evidence based. Abby developed a nomogram for F uh, for femtosecond AK, but again, this was for naturally occurring or native astigmatism. Humeric and Wu was the first one to develop FS AK nomograms for post PKP astigmatism. This is the Hanna nomogram. McGee and Buzar has shown it, it was very, very easy for them to explain that the arcuate incision should follow the steep portion or the red portion of the topography. And uh, the Toronto University nomogram is the most simple. They used pair arc incisions centered on the steep axis. And the Toronto formula used 60 degrees for six diopters, 70 degrees for seven diopters, and so forth. The most recent nomogram was developed by Claire, and this is the, the publication. Again, it is a very good nomogram, but I still see that the Toronto formula is, is very handy in these, in these patients. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it's a nice talk, but there's no much time to discuss, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Mohammed Imad Alilu. He's a consultant uh, mid-care. Uh, he's going to talk about under and over correction, post refractive surgery, how to handle this patient. It's Dr. Mohammed, it's all yours. Dr. Osama, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Dear friends and colleagues, good evening for all. I'm sure that after uh, this uh, heavy meal with Dr. Muhammad Husni and Dr. Sharif, a lot of cases, topography, I will try to make it simple and fast. That's uh, good. My, my talk will be about undercorrection and overcorrection in post laser refractive surgery. We will start. Uh, as a refractive surgeon by the definition of success. What do you mean by success in the refractive surgery? Uh, it is defined as reaching the best possible visual performance without visual aid. But as we all know, visual performance has many parameters, visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, color vision, visual field, depth of perception. So it's a kind of multifactorial uh, aspects which define the patient's satisfaction. Apart from the technical and ocular uh, issues, there is also so many other issues like social, psychological, cultural, and the type of personality. So in conclusion, uh, to determine whether it is over correction or under correction, or when we need to intervene, it's the kind of uh, multi factorial decision which need to be taken. So sometimes we need to intervene even if the recorded vision is almost 2020. So in order to move from this uh, kind of general terminology to most specific scientific parameters, we went and 
uh, sorry, I can't control the screen. So we went to uh, this, the, the success parameters. I just want to share these simple definitions with my uh, colleagues. The, effic the efficiency index, it is, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some uh, chat pop-ups comes in the middle of screen. Do you see something like that, Dr. Osama? No. Okay, so efficiency uh, index, safety index, predictability uh, of, uh, the, the, uh, of, the, um, of diabetic index. So uh, those kind of parameters help us in defining the access of any procedure, whether that patient has benefit from this procedure or uh, he had lost some of his vision and we need to intervene to restore the things back. So when we decide to intervene, we need first to know that why this is happening. Why is the source of the refractive uh, problem which is comes for us? Sorry, I, I'm just seeing something coming on my screen. I need to fix it. Yeah, for us it's fine, by the way. Yeah. Now it's fine. So, as we all know that the, the main source of in under correction or over correction is the refraction. The refraction measurement should have a gold standard, which is the manifest subjective refraction. But there is so many factors affecting this gold standard. Examiners, patient, lighting, room conditions. And it looks like also we uh, were very successful in developing our tools. We have very excellent machine, a lot of uh, investigation and treatment machine, but still we cannot control the main source of error, which is the human aspect. So in the literature review, 80% uh, agreement uh, among multi-refractionists, they took around 40 refractionists and do uh, and, and refraction uh, a group of patients. And they found out that for uh, a margin of 0 0.25, only 80% agreement with the refraction, while for 95 uh, within half the after the agreement jumped to 95%. So the, the human uh, resource is the, one of the main factors. So we need to, as a preventive, uh, in order not to get overcorrection or undercorrection, we need to be very careful in refracting our patient and have our standardized way of doing this. Psychologic refraction is also another tool which helps us in detecting the accommodative or false myopes. And the gold standard is that the, the difference between the manifest refraction and the psychologic refraction should be zero. So in case we have a, high, a higher difference, we need, that, we need to be keep in mind that there should be some lower predictability of the results. FLAB and epithelium play an uh, important role in deciding the final results. As we all know that cutting the FLAB and the repositioning it will have its own effect in, in, in uh, inducing some stigmatism and also we all now more and more aware about the powerful epithelium and its ability to remodeling plus the dry eye effect post laser vision correction. I'm talking about this uh, sort of error to know why we are having over and under correction. So excimer nomogram also play an important role uh, some technical errors and failures like the calibration of the machine, the special attention to the sign of sufficient docking or microcular consumption, the patient management and cooperation all play an important role in getting over and under correction. But now we need to go to the real life data. All these factors uh, had resulted that we have a percentage of patients we need to intervene 
What is the worst percentage of, people, of patients? Sidrelsky et al. has reported a prevalence of around 2.3 uh, in a group of 2,800 eyes. Reinstein has reporting prevalence up to 4.4 in around 2,643. Those patients, 71% of the treatment of the retreatment were performed within the first year with a main waiting time of 10 to 11 months. So this is an important clinical point. We need to wait some time, enough time, at least six months and uh, maybe up to 10 months uh, before making the decision of intervention, the treatment done more for undercorrection than overcorrection. So we are, as a refractive surgeon, tend to undercorrect. And the treatment, of course, was for sphero-cylinder in, in uh, 86%. Now, when we decide to uh, intervene and to do under uh, to do retreatment, we need to uh, define or do uh, classify the cases, whether it is an uncomplicated laser vision correction or it was a complicated laser vision correction which lead to this under or over correction. So we should start by uh, getting a, the most information we can get. We, we have to go to do topography, tomography, apirometry, and even HD analyzer, try to get the more uh, information as possible from this uh, patient, from this the, 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 the cornea and the eye of this patient. And then uh, we need to go and sit with the patient and have a very good informed consent. We have to explain the full information about his case and the risk which is uh, connected with the retreatment, then we tailor the treatment plan accordingly, according to the data we have and to uh, the patients, what he is willing to accept and what he is refusing to do that. So if uh, it is a simple regression, that will be the piece of pie, the easiest part. If it is regularly irregular cornea, if we end up with regular irregular cornea, we can consider in these cases, tobo guided approach. And if it is irregularly irregular cornea, and this is most of the cases when we have a complicated laser vision correction or a severe complication, uh, the, the approach here based on uh, doing uh, phototherapeutic keratectomy as a first step and then reevaluate and decide what to do next. So one minute, Mr. To... Mohammed. Sorry? One minute more. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm just a Treatment might take more than one steps in complicated cases. Just a, a quick uh, reminder, LASIK, we have uh, some options to, for treatment. Either we can do a new flap or we can lift the old flap and keeping in mind the higher incidence of epithelial ingrowth. PRK on top of LASIK flap, we need to be careful about the haze. And PRK, we can repeat the PRK with uh, special attention to haze or we can uh, do LASIK also. Uh, the interesting thing is the treatment, retreatment options for smile. This includes circle, which turn that cap into a similar to LASIK flap. We can do thin flap LASIK in, on the top of smile cap if we have enough thickness. And we can do smile on top of smile, which is still an evolving approach. Thank you, Dr. Osama. Thank you I very hope much. It was simple and fast. Uh, not fast, really. It's it was <laughs> meant <laughs> anyway. So it's, it's a nice, and then hopefully we have more time. But at the finish, if we discuss anything, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Sandeep Mitra, as a consultant cornean refractive surgeon. He's going to talk about complication of failed procedure, which is always a challenge when you want to do a surgery, and then the, they have complication, and you have to deal with this complication. Uh, we can stop your share, that's good. So Dr. Sandeep, is all yours now. If you want to share your screen, please. Yeah, so uh, complication for the audience, of failed... you can Please, you can write a question for audience. If you want to write any question, please put it in the question box so we can answer them. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Osama. Uh, complications of failed refractive procedures uh, is always a challenge. And let me start with the oldest technique, which has now become very popular, is the surface treatment, PRK. Uh, we know that haze screen, is one of the complications. Can you share your screen still, Sandeep? It's not shared. Okay, just a moment. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So um, one of the problems of uh, refractive surgery which we see today is uh, the superficial haze, which can be of different grade after PRK. Uh, basically, there are two types. Type 1, which starts early, three months uh, before three months, and it disappears in a year time. And the other one is type 2, which starts late, and it takes up to three years to disappear. The problem is these haze gets aggravated with the UV light, which is more prevalent in this part of the world. Uh, which causes some sort of a myofibroblast proliferation. Topical steroids should be used for three months and use of mitomycin 0.2 or 0.4% is uh, advocated in these cases. But once you have an established haze, you can either do a trans epithelial PTK with mitomycin or you can do a lamellar keratectomy or a femtosecond ALK and this haze can be treated very well. The next common, uh, very common complication is stray, which is seen in LASIK uh, thin flap higher uh, corrections. And this is because when the flap sits in higher corrected stromal bed, it tends to, it tends to misalign very, uh, very much, especially if it is a nasal flap. Uh, and the problem is if you miss the stray in the early phase, then it becomes chronic, and then you have to de the surface and then treat the uh, treat the stray. If you don't uh, diagnose them early, then it becomes difficult to treat. So one of the things is you should uh, put a drop of fluorescein uh, as soon as you finish your LASIK uh, treatment and you can look for these tree in the early phase. Uh, one of the problems which uh, I have faced in a relaxed smile procedure is keratoconus, although it's very rare. Now I have a patient, uh, 27 year old, perfectly normal keratometry, perfectly normal uh, refractions and topography. There's no history of keratoconus in the family. His brother had uh, a, a smile done and he was perfectly fine. Uh, his topography uh, looked normal. And uh, the thinnest cornea was 5.32 microns. And there was no inferior stiffening. And the K ratings were very much normal. It was not stiff cornea at all. So after all this, he underwent uh, absolutely eventless uh, smile procedure. And, uh, and then uh, there's something uh, funny happened. After a week, his vision was not 6 by 6. His vision right eye was 6 6, but left eye was 6 over 7.5. And 12 months later, he presented to me with the blurring of vision, and he had developed astigmatic error. And then when we did the topography, we found this person is suffering from keratoconus. So uh, definitely there was something we missed in this patient. And probably it's very important that in refractive surgery, when we are looking for keratoconus, we should use a multimodal approach, not just the history, the clinical examination, you should use topography, the slim fogs images, the posterior elevation, and, and today we can use the TBI. So once you have diagnosed with keratoconus, it's important that patients should be subjected to uh, collagen cross-linking. And that's what we did for the left eye. And after one year, his, uh, his cornea has not progressed. His right eye, of course, remains stable. So one of the, uh, the challenges today is to find keratoconus early before you do uh, refractive procedure. And I, I think the Randleman ectasia scoring is a very good guide towards that. Uh, this is another problem which we face, uh, adenovirus infection after LASIK. Uh, the patient had a very uneventful LASIK one year back and then came, uh, came with adenovirus infection and the vision had dropped. Uh, these patients, uh, we have to treat them for uh, at least six months to one year before attempting any procedure. Uh, the, prob the, the good thing is that the patient already had a regression. So by doing a PTK in this patient was not a difficult choice. We did a topography-guided transepithelial PTK with mycomycin and uh, the patient did well after... Uh, four months, the patient recovered good vision. I'll not go into the treatment planning. Let's skip all that. Uh, the other issue which, uh, which we uh, see uh, in, in smile patients is decentration. So when, when you are doing treatment with smile, it's very important that you dock properly and you don't decenter your treatment. But in case there is a decentration in smile, you should not remove the lenticule and you just proceed with... Uh, 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 with a, with ab abolition of the surgery, and you can then replan the surgery either in form of LASIK or a PRK. 
Uh, if you, uh, um, however, if you just remove a lenticular decentered uh, smile, it's a disaster, and the patient keeps having a lot of glare and halos, and the treatment is never, uh, never good. Flap perforation is one of the rare complications in smile, but it can happen. And again, if it happens, it's better not to proceed, and it's better to stop the surgery and do a surface uh, PRK topography guided, and these patients do well. Incision tears are also very common. Uh, this is very common because if you are trying to put an incision opening for lenticular removal less than 2.2, uh, you can enlarge the flap while, while dissecting the lenticule. And again, this can induce astigmatism and it's better to have a 2.8 or 3 millimeter opening while you're trying to remove the lenticule. Sometimes it also happens when the patient is trying to move the eye while you are trying to remove the lenticule. And it's worth that you stabilize the globe by counter-traction so that there is no uh, sudden movement of your instrument while you are inside the eye and you're trying to remove the lenticule. Uh, this is another complication which happens in uh, smile. And this is a patient uh, who had an unteventful uh, smile procedure. And day one, uh, the patient presented with uh, uh, poor vision because of uh, island of lenticule was left. And you can see the anterior OCT, which is showing uh, a lenticule which is uh, left behind. And there's a irregular astigmatism. The best way is to mark the lenticule, which has been left on a slit lamp, and then take the patient back to the uh, operating lab table, use a slit to uh, locate the lenticule, and then you can dissect it out and remove. If you do that early, the patient uh, gets very good vision back. So this is a case, you can also do a negative staining. You can put a drop of bread pour, and uh, on the table, you can uh, pick up these lenticular fragments and you can remove them. Coming to LASIK flap injury. Now, this is one patient who had uh, surgery done by me 10 years back, and he was doing well, 20-20 uh, vision. Suddenly, he presented uh, with, uh, with a history of injury to his flap while he was cutting his mustache with his scissors. And uh, he developed uh, recurrent erosions and pain in this eye. Although his vision was good, but he, he was very, very symptomatic. So we did a PTK with mitomycin topography guided. Uh, of course, the vision improved to 2020, but uh, he, he had to use glasses uh, and he was asymptomatic. So this is another thing, the flap injuries can happen even years after LASIK surgery. Um, this is another patient who presented to me from uh, another place uh, with uh, uh, vision was not bad, six to nine after LASIK surgery. And, he, and she was complaining of some sort of a foreign body and then when we examined the patient on slit lamp, we found a transparent uh, piece of material left behind under the flap. Uh, so it's very important that uh, once you do a LASIK, especially when you use microkeratome, that you drape the eyes well. And then sometimes the part of the drape is caught in your microkeratome and is deposited under the flap. So we looked at the flap. We just marked the, the transparent uh, material on the slit lamp. And then we removed it after lifting the flap. The patient was asymptomatic and gained division of six by six. DLK after smile is rare, but it can happen. Uh, this is another thing where, uh, where you can see uh, the spread of uh, these white cells in, in, in the pocket where the lenticule has been emptied. And if you find that the treatment remains the same, you just go, go ahead and wash the uh, interface with uh, dexamethasone and put the patient to frequent steroids, both uh, topical and systemic, depending upon the grade of PLK. Now, this is another patient. Uh, she was a 25-year-old Asian lady, operated in, uh, on, in a home country with LASIK. And she presented 15 days later with pain uh, in her eyes. And uh, she was advised to use Tobradex by her uh, doctor without knowing exactly what has happened. And actually, she was poked by her, her son while she was uh, holding her son with a nail. And uh, surprisingly, the corneal scraping came as a fungal infection. And we had to start the patient on amphotericin because natomycin is not available with us. Ultimately, she had a perforation, which was then sealed with uh, glue, uh, with, uh, with our uh, cyanacrylic glue. Uh, luckily, she improved, her vision improved to 6 by 9 after three months of treatment. She has a central scarring, but her vision has improved. 
So um, injury after LASIK is possible, and it's very important that uh, especially mothers with small kids should ask them to wear protective uh, glasses when they are uh, nursing their children. So uh, refractive surgery is always a challenge because we are dealing with eyes which have perfect vision and uh, complications do occur. We cannot run away from them. It's better to manage them as early as possible. And if you are unable to do it, it's better to take an opinion from your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandeep. That's perfect. Uh, good Thank to you, Dr. Also. Sandeep. Okay, our next speaker will be Dr. Usama Jlidi. Dr. Usama Jlidi is a consultant in ophthalmology in Moorfield Eye Hospital, Dubai. He's talk, he will talk about post-refractive corneal infection. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, it's a long day for everyone, I think. Is it, can you see it now, screen? Yes, yeah. So basically, we just, I'm going to talk about post-refractive corneal keratitis. Uh, keratitis after LASIK surgery is either could be infective, uh, such as bacteria, fungal, and amoeba, or it could be non-infective, as inflammatory, but margin keratitis. Uh, it's more of anti-inflammatory, uh, non-infective is more common, really, than the infective. Uh, I'm not sure it doesn't want to move. It's working. Uh, but it didn't move the slide. I'm not sure. It didn't move the one second. I just want to do something. Okay. But that doesn't move the slide, isn't it? Slide is move, not moving. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. No, it's sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. normal. Sorry for that. So post LASIK infection is really is a potentially devastating, and, but it's a rare complication. It is estimated like one in a thousand or 5,000 procedure, you get risk of infection. Uh, Non-tuberculous mycobacteria, it was common at one stage, but now it's become much less, but MRSA become an increase and there's different organism that can cause infection, post LASIK, uh, staph or is one of them, uh, mycobacteria, colony, nucardia, but it's different spectrum of disease. It's very important really to know the epidemiology. In the survey 2001, uh, Asker is looking for post LASIK uh, bacteria keratitis. At that time, mycobacteria, almost 50% of the infection coming from mycobacteria. Uh, but since they started the four generation colonial in 2004, really that uh, it was a game of change. So mycobacteria become a rare 5%. But staph ores become more increased. 2008, the MRSA it become over increased also, but still the the mycobacteria and other become the same level. So epidemiology is very important to understand. But use of four generation cooling loan has helped a lot. Both the LASIK infective keratitis usually can be presented early in the first two days, but with a typical mycobacteria or fungal, it can be presented late, like two weeks to even three months. And usually patients have symptoms same like bacteria ulcer, uh, red, uh, reduced vision, pain. Although the pain, post LASIK is less because we're cutting the flap, reducing the pain sensation. So the pain is not as the normal corneal ulcer, uh, photophobia, charge, redness, and lid swelling. Uh, always when any case with suspicion infective keratitis, post LASIK, you need to, to do the culture and using broad spectrum. Shall we lifting a flab or not, or a drug antibiotic choice? That's the case by case, but you need to, to understand that it's very important, first of all, to understand risk factor and the prevention. I think the prevention is very important, really, because basically coming for laser surgery, you want to improve the vision. The last thing you want to have is to have infection for this patient, because that will can cause a, a very serious problem to this patient, because any lose of vision, that's a problem. MRSA, as we call, say, is increased, and nowadays it's better to identify the carrier and to treat them before. Anyone had blepharitis, you need to treat that. And the surgery technique, really, you need to be very strict with sterilization technique, providing IUD before. It's very important to have a good surgical drip, get this out, eyelashes out of the way. Always better to use two instruments for each, every instrument for one eye, so to prevent any cross infection. You don't want to have infection in both eyes if that happened. And very important when you lift the flap, avoid any fluid, go to the interface, and uh, always using for generic quinolone. That's really is very helpful.
to prevent infection, especially the mycobacteria. Uh, when you had infections, it's always better to take a, a scraping to identify the organism and start intensive antimicrobial treatment. Any case with suspicion of typical bacteria, which is usually coming, uh, patient will come after a few weeks from the laser and localize and filtrate. Uh, usually, you, in this patient, need to consider when you do a corneal scrape, consider as fast staining and lose the Johnson media. And sometimes you need to ask the lab to keep this culture much longer than what we do before. We, uh, sometimes we need to give it for eight weeks to get the culture. Regarding lifting a flap or not, it's case by case. Usually, as it, you go to, if it's periphery, you could do partial lifting, or, but if it's more in the center or the, near the hinge, you have to lift the flap completely. Uh, so the benefit of lifting the flap, first of all, you obtain the culture, by also by depriving, the cleaning the organism and inflammatory cell that help also. But also when you're lifting a flap, you could soak the bed with antibiotic that will have a strong intensive antibiotic dose for the infection. By lift, but lifting a flap, it will create stria, it will promote epithelium and growth and also painful for the patient. Uh, there's a problem with the LASIK itself. The flap is, is like not the normal corneal ulcer. That the flap is intact, the epithelium. So that's prevent a good penetration of the antibiotic. It's recommended really sometimes to do a deprivement, to do a like a small epithelium defect over the ulcer to allow the better penetration of the antibiotic. There's also risk of flap melting with the infection. And you may need to treat the patient for longer time for mycobacteria. And sometimes even you need to amputate the flap if someone not responding, especially for mycobacteria. Uh, same things with any bacterial ulcer. If it's bacterial ulcer infection, you need to use fortified antibiotic, uh, fortified like tobramycin, gentamicin, alternated with vancomycin. But non tuberculous mycobacteria, you need to consider longer treatment. Amikacin, although they have poor penetration, but it's still the drug of choice for uh, mycobacteria, uh, other clerkomycin. Nowadays, the fourth generation quinolone, all of them is very good, effective, and really it helps us a lot to prevent it to happen from start, because really a nightmare to have mycobacteria infection. Uh, Tobramycin, sobrofoxacillin, always consider oral clerkomycin systemic for this patient, but also with any corneal infection, especially after laser, you don't want to have any flap melting, so always start with doxycycline to prevent melting because you don't want to change the refraction also. A steroid may be worse the condition and you really you need to identify organism. Once the patient improves, you start the steroid treatment. But if you had severe DRK, you may consider flap lift and wash as a treatment for both for the infection, but also for the inflammation. Uh, one study looking to uh, the causes for infection and non-infective keratitis was LASIK. Well, this is very a huge study, really. It's uh, 10,477 patients, so it's a huge. And looking for post-LASIK keratitis, 2.66% of people had keratitis. Good enough that non-infection cause is the main reason. So infection keratitis is 0.3%. So it's, it's a rare uh, compared with uh, non-infectious. Infectious case, adenovirus is common, uh, but it's the non-adenovirus fungal bacteria parasitic is 30% of these cases. And the other cause is herpes simplex keratitis. The non-infected cases, usually DLK, staph marginal herpes sensitivity 50%, or could be debris related keratitis, that's also common. If you excluded adenovirus as etiology, really most of the common causes non-infectious one, non -inf and that's, uh, they don't have bad long-term side effect. Uh, this is one case, it's a really long time. This is 2003, this patient had, after three weeks from the, the, the LASIK, he had infiltrate, they did the, the hospital, they lift a flap, they did treat as DLK, they did the steroid, and did not respond, so they referred to us. We suspected typical mycobacteria. At that time, we're using chlorocrimicin, amikacin, or fluxacillin. We don't have the fourth generation at that time, by the way, in UK. So there's no improvement, it start to melt it more. So we lift it again and soak it with superfluxacillin. We're creating a bacterial defect to have better penetration of the antibiotic. And after four weeks from that culture, we had a growth that presumed no cardia, but later on, they confirmed the diagnosis of uh, mycobacteria colony. And the patient really is slowly improving over the time. Uh, over nine months is regaining. There's a bit of haze, but the vision is still good, 6.75, which is good for this mycobacteria infection when you had, because sometimes it can be a very bad result. The other case with patient who had for this, after LASIK, he's complaining of pain. You, they, you will examine this margin and filtrate that. We lifted the flap temporarily, soaked with fluxacillin, tobramycin, vancomycin. 
we're creating epithelium defect, as I mentioned earlier, real epithelium defect that allow better penetration for this antibiotic with intensive treatment. It's, it's the patient improved, patient had DLK after the, uh, some improvement, we start antibiotic, but we couldn't get any growth for the culture, but definitely uh, look like bacterial and the improvement antibiotic. The other case, like same thing is painful, photophobia, this is nine days after laser, it's localized, it's suspicious, is it mycobacteria or is it bacteria? So we did the same route, lift the flap, scrape it, and we use and initially intensive antibiotic, but, and there's no growth, but the patient is improving, so that's a good result. This is a patient really, uh, 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 I did it uh, LASIK a year and a half ago. Uh, it's uncomplicated interlaced LASIK, so we give him a routine Bradford and Vigamox four times a day. The next day his uh, vision is good, everything's fine, but three days later he complained of pain, photophobia, so we, the patient asked her to come back to the clinic, so when this is the three days, and we look carefully, she had a, a huge infiltrate in the flap edge and even outside the flap, so in both eyes and diffuse, uh, 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 but the central, the central look very clear. So at that time, is, is, shall I lift the flap, do corneal staining, scraping, or treat it as a bacteria or inflammatory keratitis? For me, after, because there's no much pain for this patient, it's uh, the infiltrate really, it's it looking extended outside the, the flap margin. It looked for me more inflammatory keratitis than, infec than infective. So increase the steroid to two hourly. I kept the Vigamox four times a day, but because it's just uh, think about the blepharitis related. So I added fisitalmic and adoxycycline for the melting and review next few days. And that's the patient has the infiltrate is start to improve it slowly over the uh, about two weeks is everything clear up and the patient is very happy and the vision is maintained very well. So staph marginal hypersensitivity keratitis really it's it's a common really I I I've seen it more common than infected one and uh, really it, you always they infiltrate in the periphery it's typical they have some infiltrate outside the the flap usually this is more typical of reactive one than infective because infective will not go outside the flap without epithelium defect often consistent with the blepharitis uh, can be a, some epithelial defect usually multiple and could be bilateral. A conclusion, really prevention is, is very important for these cases. You don't want to have infection if someone have uh, coming for refractive surgery to improve the vision because infection will can affect the vision and they become an happy patient. Any suspected keratitis post LASIK should be investigated and always consider infection and close monitor. Uh, if you have difficult case, refer to specialized center. Always consider a typical mycobacteria if some the infection started after a week or two. A staph cochal hypersensitivity is one of the commonest cause of keratitis after LASIK. Uh, it's a case by case management, so it always depends on the case. If you not improve it, consider reculture, biopsy if necessary. A treatment post LASIK non tuberculous mycobacteria is challenging, may need flab amputation. Uh, still, amicacin, clarithromycin, and fourth generation, the best drug of choice. It can be potential uh, site devastated, but really often will have a good outcome. But as I mentioned, this patient is different than patient who coming for with infective keratitis. This patient came for refractive surgery to improve the vision. So any infection really you need to be prompt and treated according, but really the prevention is the cure because I haven't seen much infection for a long time now. I think it's mainly how, how meticulous about the surgery and the medication used. Be, that will be very helpful to prevent such devastating complications. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osama, for the informative uh, presentation. I don't know if we have time for discussion. We can. Uh, I think we can because we are the last session. So we have one question here from the uh, attendees regarding the, the, the time. It will have different time for PRK, different time of uh, uh, mitomycin application for the PRK. Dr. Usama? Is it for me the question? For all four, for, for all <laughs> the <protagonists. laughs> Fair enough. Basically, metamycin C really just is a, it's a bit a different policy, different protocols. Really, if it's a, if it's a very low refraction error, uh, it depends uh, if it's the Western person, I think uh, if it's less than three day up to less than 50 micro, I don't use metamycin C. But any other people from Middle East, uh, Africa, and Asia, I use metamycin C regardless what's the refractive error really. So this and is the also the timing. I usually make it 50, uh, 20, 20 seconds, but if it's a higher 
higher prescription I increase it to 30 seconds. But one thing is different really. I use the metamycin C straight after I do the laser. And that's allowed the metamycin to go deep in treatment. But if you do washing first, then you put the metamycin C. Really that's, it will be different, completely different protocol. Dr. Sandeep? Yeah, yeah, I agree with Osama that mitomycin C, uh, there is no definite protocol how to use it. And neither is there is any uh, percentage because it's very difficult. And uh, most of the proponent of mitomycin is Dr. Majumdar from US. He is the one who uses lots of mitomycin. And if you see his articles which have been published, uh, he has used various uh, percentages. But uh, probably it's better to use 0.02% and uh, 20 seconds is best. The problem is uh, when you use mitomycin for a higher percentage and for a higher time, you might have a long healing epithelial defect for a very long period of time. And in these patients in, in fact actually have more haze because of non-healing epithelium. So you'll be sitting with uh, a PRK with non-healing epithelium and, and they actually turn out to have haze. So you have to balance it out, you know. Uh, when you are uh, doing PRK. And I personally feel that anything more than minus six, minus seven diopter, if you cannot do LASIK or, or SMILE or, or PRK, it's better to do a, a fake IOL rather than challenge yourself with uh, higher corrections because invariably they will have haze, especially in UAE where the UV light is so, so strong. Uh, the, the, the main reason for haze is the, the metamorphosis of the proteoglycan and the, how the myofibroblast changes itself. So even if you give them uh, mitomycin, they develop haze. I just want here to add that uh, I personally differentiate between whether it's a, uh, a I would say in a, the first time intervention or a second time intervention. Yeah. The second time always mitomycin C. <laughs> yes, but you have to use it longer actually. Yeah. If you have to do PRK over LASIK, you have to use it for a longer time. And I would take this opportunity to ask Dr. Sandeep here a question. Uh, you mentioned that the decentration flap, or sometimes uh, you have to apport the case and do PRK. Do you use uh, mitomycin routinely in these cases? And for how long? Because this cornea has been activated by a laser energy. As we all know that using the smile, using a femtosecond laser uh, to separate the, the lenticule will activate the keratocytes. And you want to add on the top of it PRK or, uh, uh, or other intervention. You use mitomycin in this case, Dr. Sandeep? So uh, the first thing is that once you have cut a flap with femtosecond, it's better to wait. There is no urgency to immediately jump and do a procedure. Uh, the ideal situation should be that uh, your, your end lenticule should be 130, 140 microns deep. So when you are doing a PRK on the surface, you actually don't reach that depth. Uh, that's one thing. But yes, uh, mitomycin C is required in these cases, depending upon the refractive error. And uh, I, I don't think there is a big, big challenge there because uh, even if you do a femtosecond, um, correction, the laser, although it damages the stromal fibers, uh, the damage is much different than what you do with the excimer laser, which induces heat. So the, the, the effect of femto laser on keratocytes is different compared to the effect of excimer laser on the, uh, on the keratocytes. So um, I, I think there is a difference, but I, I cannot say off, say off record that uh, there is a study to uh, differentiate these two effects, one by excimer and one by uh, femto, but they are not the same. So I, I don't think it matters. So if you're doing uh, PRK over uh, a femto laser, it's, it, it's, you should use a mitomycin C. And there's more, no risk. Of one more question came to my mind when you uh, uh, put these nice cases, actually, this decentered smile. When you uh, reoperate, I do believe that, the, that there will be some edema in the tissue. So how long you are waiting before intervent and again, and would you correct the same amount of refractive error which originally calibrated, or you will correct uh, the, the end up 
what you have end up with after uh, this unsuccessful intervention? So uh, ideally, you should wait for three months or at least two refractive errors, which are uh, uh, a month apart where it has not changed. So that should be your criteria to proceed, number one. Number two is uh, in, uh, I have only had one dissertation which I treated with, uh, with a LASIK, not PRK, uh, because I had uh, done the 90 micron flap and I, had, I, I could do the laser correction and there was no problem. But you're right, uh, if there is an edema you suspect, and if you're doing an anterior OCT uh, to document that there is a change in the thickness of the cornea, then probably it might. But um, I, I cannot say a, a correct answer here because I, I, it has to be a study of 10, 15, or 20 cases you know, of decentered spine. And uh, um, I, I don't have the record. I have only one case to comment on. So it's, it's a very, very not, small. Not only when decentered, when you have, for example, to afford the case and go and do thin LASIK flap on the top of smile, same consideration is applied, I think, because. Yeah, it's true. You're, true. You're right. So that's why you have to wait. Uh, I mean, what's the hurry? You can always tell the patient, look, uh, the, the, the surgery didn't go well. Just wait enough for the refraction to stabilize. And I think you should wait as long as you can till the refraction stabilizes. So you should have at least two or three refractive uh, follow-ups wherein the, the person's uh, refraction doesn't change. And if you are suspecting that, okay, there is an edema on the stroma, measure the corneal thickness. You have anterior OCT. Do a repeated measurement of corneal thickness and see what is happening. So you can document. So there's no, no need to hypothesize. You, know, you can always measure it and see how it looks. Thank you for this uh, for your comment. Uh, I think we need to to to, to wait for two months to, for the vision to, to be stable, and then we can do the enhancing it after into laser after laser after smile. I, don't know if I agree. I, agree. I, I fully I fully agree with you, Dr. Sharif. You should wait. There should not be any hurry and jump and correct the patient. Hi, Dr. Mohammed. Hello, Dr. Osama. Hello, Dr. Mohammed. I hope Mohammed. you are doing well, and you come to the end. Yeah. We already finished our session. Any question, so I want to come to say hello for everyone here in this session and to thank all Muhammad. of our speakers. And uh, I would like to deliver my uh, also thanks to uh, the company they are sponsoring this uh, conference, uh, starting by Novartis, Spire and Allergan, uh, Amico, Linatus, and FGC, uh, and all others. I don't remember Atlas. So I'd like to thank all our partners in this. Uh, conference. Uh, I would like also to thank all our eminent speakers. They are sharing with us their experience and they are supporting in and handling all this and giving these talks during these four days. Uh, I'd like to thank you all and many thanks also to the participants and many, many thanks to my dear friends. Uh, they are sharing and preparing for this conference, the committees scientific and organizing, and special thanks also to committees on cataract and refractive, pituitary ROP, and also for glaucoma, Dr. Darrell, and for the oculoplasty. Thanks a lot. And if there is any success, it is because of you and all of our speakers and participants that are attending this conference. And we are sorry and for any inconvenience it's happened during this conference. And we hope to see you, inshallah, in September with Miom 16, 17, and 18. Thanks a lot, and good night. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, you. for your thank you, thank you nice much. effort, actually. You are the, the milestone uh, in this event. And Thanks I a lot, like Dr. Thank all the panelists. Thanks thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for your effort, and all our Qasimi Hospital team. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Sharif. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead, Sandeep. I thank you all. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. And uh, good night, everyone. And uh, thank you for the participants to stay late. And uh, look forward to see you again soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah.